Acts chapter 7 is where we're going to be at. Um, we're going to look at 36 verses, just so you know, I'm not going to start off reading every all 36 verses. We'll just kind of work through this here at Acts chapter 7 in this uh, series I've called Church on the Move. Uh, uh, we've looked at this man named Stephen and uh, how he came about and, and how God used him. So here in verse 7, this is where things get difficult, and this is an important series for our church because we're going to have to work through difficult times. We're working through some difficult times right now. Uh, just starting in verse 1 here. Then said the high priest, are these things so? And it's talking about Stephen, things he was doing. And he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharon. And he said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy uh, king, uh, kindred and come into that land which I will show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelled in Sharon from thence. When his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein, now, uh, wherein ye now dwell. And he gave them none inheritance in it, no, not so much as uh, to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise or this way that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and treat them four hundred years. And the nation uh, uh, to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Uh, I'm going to stop there because this is part of uh, this message of Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. How Stephen is using the Old Testament and he's using that to point them to Jesus. Everything he's talking about, he's basically summed up the entire book of Genesis. I'll read verse 8. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision... And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs, and the patriarchs with envy sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of the, his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. And I'm going to stop there at verse 10, because now we see this guy basically preached a survey over Genesis and how that points to Jesus. So uh, let's pray and we'll continue on. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for this day. God, I pray that You would use this message tonight to help our church. Uh, I know there's many that are struggling. I know there's many that are discouraged. There are some that are confused. Perhaps even there's maybe some that are watching later or even here tonight that maybe are even just frustrated. And uh, that's understandable. I pray that You would uh, help us to work through those things. God, help us to focus on what You want us to get out of this message tonight, may we look at Stephen's message of Jesus and know that that's a message we need to take with us from these wall, from beyond these walls tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There was a survey done from some nine, eight, nine, and ten-year-olds about what should a pastor say. They, they take a survey of all these eight and nine-year-olds. So the first one says, Please say in your sermon, Peter Peterson has been a good boy all week. I am Peter Peterson. Sincerely, Pete, age 9. Carla, age 10, says that this is what a pastor ought to say. Are there any devils on earth? I think there may be one in my class. Arnold, age 8, says, I know God loves everybody, but He never met my sister. Sincerely yours, Arnold. Another one, I am sorry I can't leave more money in the plate, but my father didn't give me a raise in my allowance. Could you have a sermon about a raise in my allowance, please? Love, Patty, age 10. Annette, age 9, says, My mother is very religious. She goes to uh, bingo at church every week, even if she has a cold. Yours truly, Annette, age 9. I would like to know... I would like to excuse me, go to heaven someday because I know my brother won't be there, Stephen, age 8. The, uh, I've got a couple more here, and I'm reading these for a reason. It's not to be funny, but it's to really lay some groundwork here. I think a lot more people would come to your church if you moved it to Disneyland, Lauren, age 9. Please say a prayer for our Little League team. We need God's help or a new pitcher. Thank you, Alexander, age 10. 
My father says I should learn the Ten Commandments, but I don't think I want to because we have enough rules already in my house. Joshua, age 10. How does God know the good people from the bad people? Do you tell him or does he read about it in the newspapers? Sincerely, Marjorie, age 9. I liked your sermon on Sunday, especially when it was finished. Ralph, age 11. I think some have probably said that here. I hope to go to heaven someday, but later rather than sooner. Love, Ellen, age 9. My father should be a minister. Every day he gives us a sermon about something. Robert, age 11. I think him and I have the same dad. Spurgeon, had, some people credit Spurgeon with this. I don't know if he said it or not, but if you read Spurgeon's books, it, it bears out, I believe. Uh, he says to take the text and make a beeline for the gospel as we believe that Jesus is illustrated on every page. There's a video, I need to share it sometime, I need to find it. There's this young man, he's probably 12 or 13 years old, and he rattles off the, the whole, all the books of the Bible. And he says about two sentences. He summarizes these every book in the Bible. He, he, and he talks about how every book, when he summarizes it, how it presents Jesus and it presents, presents God's love. Tonight, we are looking at a rather difficult duty. And that, one, it's a sermon here in chapter 7 that's 53 verses long. Obviously, I've chopped it up. We're going to look at part 1 tonight, part 2 next time. But we are in no way going to attempt to get through all 53 verses tonight. And yet, it's, it's extremely hard to break up. Paul writes to us in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 12-14, through Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. You don't have to be eloquent to present Jesus. You don't have to have a doctorate's degree or bachelor's degree to present Jesus. It's no different than when you tell somebody about your favorite restaurant or your favorite thing you experience. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look uh, to the end of that which was abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away from the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Pretty clear there that Jesus Christ takes away all these things that had clouded their eyes. And the, the Old Testament actually clouded their eyes a little bit, because not because the Old Testament was wrong, but because they focused so much on things on the outside. And we think, oh, they were so silly to keep doing sacrifices. Oh, people today that do sacrifices are so silly. You know what, friends? We have people that think sometimes baptism is going to save them. Sometimes people think that church membership is going to save them. Most things are not going to save them. We're going to look at a few things tonight about, Jesus, about Stephen's message about Christ. We see, first of all, Stephen's hint to the Sanhedrin in the first eight verses. For sake of time, I'm not going to reread all of that, but we see here his hint to the Sanhedrin. Stephen isn't concerned uh, with getting his desired outcome. He knows he has a big target on him and that this trial is rigged against him. He's using the Old Testament to present Jesus. He's preaching. He's doing what we're, what, what we're doing right now. He's preaching. But he knows that this trial is real. He is being faithful. He isn't looking at who's here and who's not here. He is looking at simply being faithful and being committed to the task that is before him. He hints to God's challenge to Abraham in verses 1-3. through three. Faith for the Jews began at Abraham. He used Abraham because every Jew pointed back to Abraham. Every Jew said, look, I've got this lineage in Abraham. We have this thing in common. Abraham's our guy. Abraham is our superhero, basically. So they looked back at him. And Stephen says, look, God gave Abraham a task. Faith was not first shown by an institution or an organization, but an individual. We see... When you read in Hebrews, it says, By faith, Abraham pleased God. Not by his actions, not by his money, not by his church membership, not by where he sat every Sunday, but by faith. He hints to Abraham's faith in God in verses 4-5 through five of Acts chapter 7. He went all the way out to a land. How many of us would be willing to just pack every earthly possession we could into our car, our van, or our truck and just go to a land with very little instructions? I don't know that I could do that. You're like, well, 
Where's your faith at? You're right, where is my faith at? Here's the thing though, God gave that to Abraham. If somebody were to say today, God gave me a vision to get up and pack up everything and go, does it line up with, with this? Does it line up with this? Because God's given me this. And if I can't follow this the way that I should, I'm not going to know where I should be. If I'm not in God's Word, I'm not going to know if I should be at Mount Zion Baptist Church or not. If I'm not following this the way I should, I'm not going to know what house to buy or what job I ought to have or what decision I ought to make in life. I've got to look at the things that are clearly black and white or red in Scripture and understand that and obey that before I look at something in life that's complicated. Abraham had a clear revelation from God. This is our clear revelation, ladies and gentlemen. The infallible, inerrant Word of God. Which, by the way, there's fewer and fewer pastors and fewer and fewer followers or Christians, let me use the term loosely, that believe God's Word is infallible. There's people at colleges and universities and even in some seminaries that say it's not really God's Word. It contains God's Word, but it's not God's Word. There's stuff like that being taught. Or there's people that just discount the Bible altogether. There's a guy that wrote a book, and I've got it in my library. It's probably the most heretical book I've ever bought. I felt like I had to go to the altar of repentance after reading it. It's called Misquoting Jesus. This guy's name is Bart Ehrman. He grew up in a Baptist church, and he spent most of his, his adult life picking apart the Bible, trying to shoot it down and say it's full of errors. He says it's a nice piece of literature. He said that in a YouTube video. It's a nice piece of literature. Friends, I, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for this book right here. I don't know that I would even be alive if it wasn't for this book right here. And I don't mean spiritually either. We've got to move on. The moment that God had spoken, Abraham left his home in Ur and, and, joined, and journeyed to upper the upper Euphrates. Later on, he settled in Canaan, which was the land promised to him. Abraham had no physical building or dwelling to look to in Canaan. He had a promise, but he never had a specific place. God desired for Abraham to be in a place of faith, being placed, his faith being, excuse me, placed in God completely alone. Stephen points out the temple's temporary nature here. All believers are of the family of God being in the line of Abraham. Romans chapter 4 verses 8 through 13 lay this out here. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it reckoned? For he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness, of faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being not being yet uncircumcised for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. A lot of circumcision, uncircumcisions there, right? It's talking about that outward circumcision, but God is more concerned about the inward circumcision. And the question there was, is it about what you do? Is it about where your trust is at? And it's about where your trust is at. We see in verses 6 through 8 that we've already read that Stephen hints to Abraham's course. It would be over the course of 400 years of struggles, problems, and tragedies, then on to Egypt before the children of Israel would see the promised land. Abraham's faith would always go back to what did God say. He always retreated back to that. Circumcision was designed to be a sign to remind the people of God's ownership and blessing from the days of Abraham through the early patriarchs. Even before a temple was built or a single law was penned, there were people of faith. What God was doing in Abraham happened way before the law was given on Mount Sinai. God speaking to Abraham, 
telling him to obey him, telling him to place his faith in where Abraham was leading him. Where's God leading us today? Where's God leading us? You may not be able to answer that, and that's okay. But but I'm going to tell you where you're not going to find it. You're not going to find it on the internet. You're not going to find it in uh, at Hollywood, which, by the way, if you think uh, a movie is going to inspire you, when I say a movie, I'm talking a secular movie. Um, it's probably going to lead you down a path of carnality, a path of worldliness. Your political candidate isn't going to help you find that either. Because right now we've got in the news stories about a former president that had unclassified documents at his house. And we've got stories about a sitting president that has unclassified documents at his house. It sure makes you wonder sometimes, what, what can we believe? What's really true? To be real honest with you, things that are going on in America, I don't know that we're ever going to know the truth. There's things we've learned about certain events 30, 40, 50 years later. Very different than probably what America knew at that time. We see secondly, Stephen's help for the Sanhedrin. So verses 9 and 10 we already read. We'll pick up at verse 11 and read down to verse 16. Stephen's help for the Sanhedrin. Now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. So he's talking about a a, a famine. Verse 12, But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, And all his kindred, three some and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried uh, over into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Amor, the father of uh, Sychem. I I mispronounced that, Sychem, not Shechem. So we see the help for the Sanhedrin. He's explaining here now the parallels of Jesus and and, uh, some of these patriarchs. He mentions that Joseph was rejected by his own. Joseph was a type of Christ. Just as the brothers had envied him, so did the Sanhedrin with Jesus back in verse number 9. The the brothers that Joseph had, they wanted to silence him, so they sold him into slavery. What's the best way to silence somebody? Get rid of them. Right? Right? That's what the world wants to do with a lot of Christians today. If I can just get rid of them, if I can silence them, that's all they want to do. Stephen argues that man's tendency is to reject truth. You know, the first eight years of my life, I rejected truth. I would even tell you at, at, at age eight, before I got saved, I would say, why would God send me to hell? I'm a pretty good kid. I'd compare myself. I don't, I don't get in fights at school. But I was still a sinner. I had other things I, that I didn't want to admit to do to, that, I, that I wasn't good enough. Joseph was raised up by God just as Jesus was. Joseph would rise to the keeper of the jail, keeper of Potiphar's house, then the keeper of the jail, then second to Pharaoh himself in verse 10. God has raised Jesus up as well, raised him to stand in our place on the cross, then raised him to life, seated next to him, and Jesus makes intercession for us, talks about that in the book of Revelation. You know, Satan likes to do. Satan likes to do this. If you go and you read about this in the book of Job, not the book of Job, the book of Job, in uh, chapter one, Satan is all kind of all over the place, but he goes to God. And I don't know why, I don't understand this, but God lets Satan come to him, and Satan was pointing out all these things about Job. Oh, Job only serves you because you bless him, God. God said, "Okay, take take it away. See my servant, Job." So, Satan takes everything away. Then he says, oh, Job only serves you because, you know, his health's good. Do you know what Satan does? Satan takes his health. God says you can't have his life. So much so that to where Job's own wife says, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job says, hey, I came into this world with nothing. I'll leave this world with nothing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Just like sometimes it's said in church, God is good, and the people respond back, God is good, 
And all the time, all the time, God is good. That was the attitude Job had. Joseph was revealed to his own brethren, verses 11 through 16 in Acts 7, laid this out for us. Even though the brothers discarded Joseph, God used him to save them and to save others as well. Jesus, while, be reje- while being rejected by the Jews, was not stopped from being the only way to salvation. And then Joseph was taken to the promised land. Years and years and years later, even after he died there in Egypt, even though he was nothing but bones, I don't know whether they had him in a box or what, but Joseph wanted to see that promised land. And he didn't live to see it, but they made sure they took his, his bones there. Joshua 24 verse 32 says, And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became an inheritance to the children of Joseph. He's preaching a message about Christ here, Stephen is. He's presenting a case. He's making a case for Christ. And these guys aren't buying it. We see thirdly, this evening, and I believe, yep, lastly, the Stephen's honor for Moses. Stephen's honor for Moses. Look at verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king rose which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so they cast out their young children to the end that they may not live. In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months, and was cast out. Pharaoh's daughter took him up, and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in the words and deeds. I want to stop there for a second. This wasn't just an easy time to live if you're a Jewish person. They were taking babies and killing them, which, by the way, is really not uncommon now. We have a short work shortage in this in this nation. You know that. There's actually a shortage of preachers. I still know of churches that are looking for pastors. We've known of some of them, even in our own local association that spent time. I can't help but wonder the abortion laws that have been on the books since 1973. How has that affected our churches? How has that affected our ministry? There's a work shortage right now. I can't just think that, man, I can't help but think somehow that's affected things. There's a teacher shortage. Every, every vocation has a shortage. There needs to be more, more counselors and more mental health workers. I can remember as a kid, preachers getting up, they need guys willing to preach. But yet, it's harder, I think, to find pastors now than it's been. And it just, it wasn't like that a handful of years ago. So my mind goes there when I think of that, that man, we see shortages around us of how much is the, uh, the ability to have an abortion affected that? Because that's basically what Pharaoh was doing at the time. I'm not going to let these people take over, so I'm going to take out their kids. And Moses is born to his parents, and they try to keep a baby quiet and do pretty good for a few months, and then they send him downstream. And Moses' daughter picks him up, and he grows up knowing the ways and, and the... And the uh, world of the Egyptians. In verse 23, And when he was um, full 40 years old, he came to his, bre- to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed, and he smote the Egyptian. And when it says he smote the Egyptian, it wasn't just a little across the face. He, 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 he drove a sword through him, most likely. Listen on here. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So Moses says, I'm going to be Mr. Big and I'm going to save the day, buddy. And these guys are like, who do you think you are? And Stephen's pointing this out. He's laying groundwork for Jesus here as he does this. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set uh, them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren. 
Why do ye wrong one another? He's, he's trying to tell them what to do. They're, they're not working together. He's seeing these people argue, and he says, Why can't you two get along? Verse 27. But he did, but he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee ruler and a judge over us? Kind of like, Who died and made you king? You ever heard people say that? Who made you king? Verse 28, Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And then forty years were expired, or passed, you could say there. There appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, the angel of the Lord, and the flame of fire in a bush. And then Moses saw it. He wondered at the sight. As he draw near to behold it or look at it, the voice of the Lord uh, came to him. Uh, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and uh, could, could, uh, durst not behold, or he could not behold there. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is hold thy holy ground. I have seen, and I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I have come down and delivered them. And come now, and now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a judge, or, or made thee a ruler and a judge? The same God did send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. So Stephen's honor for Moses here. The people grew in Egypt. The number of the children of Israel increased, and they outnumbered the, the people in Egypt. The people in Egypt... Tormented, were tormented there. The new Pharaoh or king decided to have all the firstborn males thrown into the Nile River. This was a, a holocaust that took place. Verse 20 is Moses' birth. And 21 through 22 is Moses' care in Egypt. He shows how God's hand is there. It's, it's quite amazing. Can you imagine putting a baby in, a, in, in a, like some sort of a mossy little uh, uh, baby kayak, you could say, and sending that baby down river. You don't know what's going to happen. That baby is is a is wildlife going is a lion or a bear just going to come and eat that child? They just they they couldn't. They were at the end of themselves. They couldn't keep the baby quiet, probably, and they send him downstream. What what a what a faith of Moses' parents there. Moses had an encounter with his brother in verses twenty three through twenty nine. Notice the similarities between Joseph. Moses, Jesus, and now Stephen. Verse 25, he was a kingsman redeemer. He was their peacemaker. But at verses 27 through 29, he was rejected. All of these men came, had a purpose, and initially faced rejection. But then they accomplished a purpose that God had. Moses was discipled in a desert, verse 29. Do you know that Moses was 40 years old? And God took him on the backside of a desert at 40 and basically took him to Bible college for 40 years. I don't think anybody goes to any type of learning for 40 years. Obviously, you might learn in life, but you don't go get a degree for 40 years, right? Moses was called by God for a work in verses 30 through 35 out in that, that uh, wilderness there. We, he doesn't touch on it here. Exactly, but Moses had to understand that there were some things that could only be learned in a desert. And one of the first things Moses did, he was out there in that desert, and these women come, and one of them ended up becoming his wife. They're coming to water their animals. And some other people come by and are kind of bullying them. And Moses stands up for these women and basically drives these guys off. If you go read about it in uh, Exodus. And eventually, because of this deed, Moses is welcomed by his uh, future father-in-law, Jethro. Not Jethro from Beverly Hillbillies, but uh, Jethro, who is going to be his father-in-law. And Jethro gave him counsel over the years. Jethro told Moses at one point, he said, you're taking on too much. You're trying to shepherd and lead all these people. You need help. You need to appoint captains over people. To help you lead them. Moses had to understand holiness in verse 33. He had to understand the love of God in verse 34. And he had to understand God's grace in verse number 35. 
Stephen was accused of preaching for Jesus and in the opposition to the temple. He was simply showing that Jesus had done away with the necessities of the ceremonial practices. He taught that Joshua and Moses were rejected of their own. Uh, he also points out that uh, Jacob, or excuse me, not Jacob, but Joseph was rejected as well, yet they continued to walk in faith. Stephen was willing to stuff, suffer for the cause of Christ. What are we willing to endure to keep the gospel alive right here at JJ Highway? What are we willing to do? Are we willing to be inconvenienced? Are we willing to be inconvenienced? It's, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's tough. I wish there was more here tonight for me to say what I'm about to say. And I, and I thought about this before, before I even came here tonight. I thought this for the last couple of weeks. Every single person that's here, we need you. If you read in the book of Revelation, you see a list of seven churches there in that book. And these churches all have one thing in common. And you know what that one thing in common is? They all have a weakness. Every church has weaknesses. Because you could say, oh, I'm going to go over here. I'm, and I, I'm not going to name churches, but you could go to a church where, man, they've got a good band. They think, woo, whip it up. That church has weaknesses. You can go to a church that's got big signs and, and, and titanic screens, and it's probably fun to sit there. That church has weaknesses. Every church in the book of Revelation that's mentioned in, in the first couple of chapters there has weaknesses. You know, the only church there that you really could commend was the Church of Philadelphia, Church of Brotherly Love. And their weakness was just that they were weak, but really, because they appeared weak, that actually was a strength for them. But this church needs you tonight. Everybody that's a current member, everybody that's a current attender, this church needs you tonight. God has given you as a gift to this church. I don't want them to, to try to inflate somebody's ego tonight, but try to understand with me that it's not just a handful of people making it happen. God wants to use you to get the gospel forward. I told somebody tonight, and we were kind of joking about it, but when we come here, our attitude ought to be, what can I do to help make this place better? And I was kind of joking about it, but to be, to be real with you, some of the kids say to be real about it, what can we do to make this place better? What can you do to make this place better tonight? In closing, there's a young man who had been preaching in the presence of an uh, important person. He had, uh, had said to this person, went to the old minister who was very important at this place. He said, what do you think of my sermon? A very poor sermon, indeed, he said. A poor sermon, said the young man. It took me so much time to study out this message. It took me so much time, he said, to put it together. He said, oh, no doubt about it. Why did you not think my explanation of the text was a very good one? He said, oh yes, says the old preacher, it was good indeed. Well then, the young man says, "What? why do you call this a, a poor sermon? Didn't you think the metaphors were appropriate and the arguments conclusive? Yes, they were very good as far as that goes, but still it was a very poor sermon. Will you tell me why you think it was a poor sermon, sir? He said, because there was no Jesus in it. If you listen to me, or anybody else, and you think that guy just wants to hear himself talk, there's a problem. There's a problem. I give these, these two listening sheets, and there's words on there, and one of them is Jesus. And I want to make sure that those tally marks, that there's a whole lot of Jesus being mentioned, because if it's not, if it's not me mentioning a whole lot of Jesus, it's me mentioning a whole lot of Josh Hall. And this world doesn't need any more Josh Hall. It needs more Jesus. And it's only going to get that by us declaring the gospel, us working together to see what we can do to point people to the hope in Christ so that we have a message of Jesus just like Stephen did. Steve, you may say, why is he going all the way back to the Old Testament? That's all he had. 
That's all he had to use. We've got a completed Bible. We see how the story ends. That ought to excite us. That ought to make us to say, look, we don't want someone to go to hell. In fact, when somebody comes here, we want to make it hard for them to go to hell. And Stephen was doing everything he could to make these people that seemed like they were religious, people that thought they had it all together, for them to see that there was a Savior that died for their sins. To make them see that, hey, your sins have been paid for by Jesus Christ. May we have a message of the cross like Stephen did. We have a message of Jesus in our lives. Each, each one of you have a story to tell. And just like it was mentioned at our Christmas program at the end, I think it was I think it was either I think it was Leah that said it or Kaylee. What's your story? What's your story tonight? I'm going to pray here and uh, then we'll really close. But there's a, uh, there's a lady on, that's been on my mind. Old time member. I talked to Linda about this. Her name was Sylvia Daniel. Or Daniels. Is that right? Is it Sylvia, Arnold. Sylvia Arnold. Excuse me. Yeah, Sylvia Arnold. She's documented in her history of our church. This lady got saved around 1930. She left to go to college out on the west coast somewhere. Uh, beyond by the University. Which that may not be a, a place you're familiar with. But she went to an Indian reservation and I believe spent a good rest of her life, from what I can tell, spent a lot of years teaching a Bible class, sharing Jesus with kids at a Navajo Indian reservation. She even went to a place in Colorado to learn the Navajo language better so that she could teach these kids in Bible classes. What type of work do we need to do here? What type of work are you willing to do? And I can't, I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer that. There's a lot of needs here. If you want to know, what can I do here? Come talk to me or go talk to Linda because we've got a whole list of things that need to be done that we need help with. Let's pray.